Well, I have had so many emails about how much you appreciate the work that Chris and Daryl are doing for the foundation and therefore doing for you. And so it is always fun for me to have them with me. And I think it's what you prefer anyway. And today is very special because a lot of the work that I've been doing since the mid eighties has been about education. At that point, it was education plus actually managing the money for people. Today, it's purely education. Uh, then it was about education and making a living. Today, it is about education and not giving a, a worry about whether we're making money because all of us are volunteers to help make you a better investor. And I've worked with heavy duty research people who were dedicated to helping the investors. And I don't think I've ever worked with anybody any more dedicated than Daryl and Chris are. So I am excited to have them here with me about a hugely important topic. And that is the recommendation of about which, not only which equity asset classes you should own, but which are the, the ETFs. And later in other sessions, we'll talk about the mutual funds, open-ended mutual funds, which are the ones you should use to represent those equity asset classes that we think you should own. Now, I, I wanna be very, very careful about how you take our advice. And it isn't that we are not 100% committed to the information that we are sharing with you and what we think is in your best interest. We have no other person but you to serve in, in this process. But the reality is we're in an industry of not only a thousand different ways to solve the problems of investing, but of millions of different individuals who have their own psychological challenges about investing or their own beliefs about what they should get out of their investing. And these beliefs and, 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 and feelings that people have about investing they do impact how they respond to what's going on with their portfolio. So I wanna make it very clear. We are not certified financial planners. We are not chartered final financial analysts. We are not registered investment advisors. We are teachers. We are people trying to, to show you at least what we believe are the right things to do. But without knowing the particulars about you. So it is virtually, when I say impossible, well, it's not totally impossible, but at some level inappropriate for us to say what we recommend is what you should do. There are simply too many moving parts. And every once in a while, we get those emails from you and you, you fill a page with all the things about you that you think are important for us to know. And there are several problems. One is the list is actually much longer than what you give us. And the second is we're not in the business of trying to give that personal advice. So please understand our limitations. And we also want you to understand that there is a big difference between art and science. And I'm not going to say that we are artists, but at the other, other spec end of the spectrum, we are not exactly scientists, although what Daryl and Chris do come much closer to science than what I do. But the bottom line is very smart people look at the very same information. 
and they come to a different conclusion. I was reminded of this just a, a couple of days ago. I was watching one of the old John Bogle videos, and he was talking about what an investor should do. And one of the things that he was advocating in this particular interview was buying whatever it is that you buy, you put it in an envelope, you close the envelope, you hold it for 50 years, you open it up and you find out what did your investment become? And he said, I think you'll be amazed. And, and, and it's an interesting uh, a challenge uh, for us. Uh, I do happen to believe that is in many ways the right thing to do. But the challenge is that what he put in the envelope is different than what we would put in the envelope. So we want you to put something different in that envelope. And we have reasons why we want you to put something different in there. But the reality is, uh, while John Bogle passed away several years ago, the reality is he knew all the same information that we know. In fact, Daryl does these wonderful telltale charts that John Bogle was the one that introduced to the best of our knowledge that way of looking at how two different asset classes might be compared. And so it's easy for us to say, how could he come to the conclusion he did? So while we believe that we have great evidence to share with you, please understand that other people look at that same evidence and evidently come to a totally different conclusion. Many people recommend actively managed funds how could they do that? Well, because either they're selling them or because they've looked at the actively managed funds that did better than the index funds. And they feel they're going to do that again. We believe they're not likely to do that again. So there's all of these forces back and forth about what's the right thing to do. What we're doing our best that we know for you is to find the ETFs and mutual funds that are gonna give you access to the asset classes, in this case, equity asset classes that you could hold for the long term. But you have to understand, we are not market timers. It's not that market timing is an evil thing to do, but for most people, it's a very unproductive thing to do. So Chris will talk about an ETF that, that he likes, he has chosen. And you might be able to look back two years ago and say, well, that was not a very good performer a couple of years ago. And that may be because at that very moment in time, it was better to be in a large small cap value than a small small cap value. And the decision to move to large small cap value would be a market timing decision. But we don't do that. We're talking about recommendations that are built to ride the waves over a very long period of time. And yet what you're going to find out is every couple of years, Chris is going to go in there for as long as he's willing to do it and to figure out, should we be making some changes that would work better for the long term. And you've sent us some great questions around that very topic that we'll get to later. So we're looking for what we feel is truly a buy and hold strategy for you. So today we're asking Daryl to just watch and if we start to fail, he's gonna catch us because Daryl, in the coming weeks, he's going to be back here with fine tuning tables and the ultimate buy and hold and the, and the telltale charts and the distribution tables. You'll have enough of Daryl later. But today, 
it's really Chris's show. And we, we are so thankful to have Chris doing this for us. And when I say us, I mean me and you and all the investors that you may be giving guidance to. So Chris, ETFs, how you pick them, how you get rid of the, of the, of the less productive and give us the most productive. And so now Daryl and I want to listen and, and uh, let, we're going to come up with our own questions likely, by the way, uh, before we're done, because uh, we're, we're excited. We've seen the outline that Chris has, and I wanted to burst right out and ask questions. So, so this is going to be fun for us too. The floor is yours, my friend. Cool. Well, uh, thanks for the gracious introduction as always, Paul. And uh, thanks to all of our listeners and the people that follow your work, not just for the questions that we're going to use today, but also for being part of the watchdog crew. You know, the way I think of it is we put those best in class recommendations out there and then um, I get challenged for two years now. I've gotten challenged and sometimes it's good ideas and interesting objections. Sometimes people catch mistakes. We are not perfect. And so I really appreciate that. Uh, let's move on. We've already heard Paul's introduction. I I'm going to summarize briefly the recommendations that we've got. We'll start there. Um, and I'm going to start with what it does for the portfolio overall, because you know I could come up with a set of recommendations just looking at these asset classes on their own, but really I'm looking to find a set of things that play well together as a set of ETFs for the best in class portfolio that Paul created. And that's 10 funds, 10% each. And if you look at this chart, um, you can see on the left-hand side, the Vanguard reference. Um, so we do an all Vanguard recommendation. Then we have the DFA reference, which is the funds that you would get if you were a customer of DFA through an advisor. And we think that those are some of the best in class funds for this kind of investing. And then we have the 2019 best in class ETFs and the 2021 best in class ETF recommendations. On the right hand side of the chart, I go through you know, what the impact was on some alternative portfolios, but I'm really gonna focus on the, the 10 fund ultimate buy and hold here. And I'm gonna focus in on the changes between 2019 and 2021. And so one of the things you notice is that instead of the overall portfolio style boxes being weighted down in the small value, it's now large value. So that's a, that's a subtle change. Um, but it actually fits with what DFA does, and it kind of fits with how I would expect the portfolio to play out based on the way it's weighted with the 10 funds anyway, because the large funds tend to be larger. Um, even though the weighting is a 10% weighting, um, you know, the bottom line is it's kind of a tie break over there. It, it could go either way, but that is a small change. If we go down and we look into how the price to book, which is a measure of how valuey things are, how that changed, it went from 1.12 to 1.09. So the new portfolio is a little bit deeper value. If you look at the average company size, it went from 6.45 billion to 7.84 billion. It's a little bit larger. The expense ratio went from 0.28% to 0.26%. It's a little bit cheaper. And the yield went from 2.81% to 2.11%. And I think that's actually a very substantial improvement because uh, yield is typically dividends that are, are taxed. You, know, you have this taxable income and it would be better for a long-term buy and hold investor, uh, especially in a taxable account, not to have to deal with that. Um, basically you have to reinvest it and it's, it's a little bit of churn and it's a tax event that you'd rather not have. And then in terms of the holdings, it stayed about the same. So. What are the changes that went into making the portfolio evolve that way? Um, two years ago, or well, a year and a half ago, Avantis introduced a number of funds. And Avantis is a company that uh, was created by people who had formerly been at DFA. They're very grounded in an academic evidence-based orientation towards investing. They have 
a lot of the same beliefs that created the DFA portfolios. Um, they do come at it with a little bit different approach from DFA. They've created ETFs. DFA didn't have ETFs until just very recently. Um, and they still provide tilts towards small in value, but they lay on top of that an emphasis on quality, um, on um, companies with good financials. And that combination of things fits really well with the way that I normally filter for companies because I look for companies uh, or funds that tilt towards small in value because that's what we're looking for in Paul's portfolios in general. But they also provide you know, some of these other attributes that have been shown over time to improve the consistency of performance or the kind of performance somebody might get, like profitability or like positive momentum or like lower volatility. And so when I ran the evaluations on the previous funds versus the Avantis funds, and I also looked at hundreds of other funds in this process, the Avantis funds in general did very well. And we'll talk through these individually, but the way I think of it at a, a macro high level is that we're getting uh, a little bit better, more well-rounded funds with slightly higher or the same expected um, return based on the way the funds look when I look inside at their attributes um, that we were getting before. So in general, I think it's an improvement. I think it should provide more consistent performance. And um, let's go through them individually. So the first one is why Avantis's U.S. fund instead of VTI, the Vanguard total U.S. market fund that we had previously. Uh, well, the average company size drops from 98 billion to 54 billion, so it's a little bit smaller. The price to book went from 3.29 to 2.81, so it's a little bit more value. The expense ratio went from 0.03% to 0.12%, so it's a little bit more expensive. But when I do my analysis of the expected predicted return, it went up by 0.3%, which covers the, the difference in expense ratio. So will that be the best performing fund next year in this category? I can't tell you that. I can't tell you that for any of these funds. It's possible you'll change in five years later, you'll still be regretting that you made the change. All I can do is apply a fairly objective process here to say which one do I think over the long term is going to give the best result. And based on that analysis, it looks to me like the Avantis fund is a very good choice and an improvement over what we had previously. So let's go to the next one, um, AVUV. This is the Avantis US small value fund instead of our former SLYV or IJS funds. So here, the average size actually goes up a little bit. It goes from 1.6 billion to 2.2 billion. The price to book, though, the measure of value improves a little bit. It goes from 1.33 to 1.24. And the expense ratio goes from 0.15 to 0.18. We had two funds, so there was a range previously, basically around 0.16 to 0.23. So it went up by a little bit. <clears throat> And the average expected ex, uh, or the average ex, uh, after expense factor predicted return here also goes up by 0.3%, which more than covers the difference in expense ratio. Um, and remember, that's after expense ratio. So this should just be an improvement in your expected return. So again, you know, it looked like a more well rounded fund. It looked like it provided um, enough benefit to justify the change. Can I just butt in for one second here, Chris, go sure. back to that? Yeah. Because um, I, I think where it gets confusing is we hear that smaller is better. And we certainly hear that lower expenses are better than, than higher expenses. Uh, we see in this particular case that more, more value oriented is better. Does this basically say that 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 difference of 0.3% is reflected in that that decrease in the price to book ratio and that was had more impact on the portfolio or are we talking about these other things like quality and momentum, et cetera? 
it, it's a combination of both of them. So thanks for slowing me down and asking the question. It's a great question. Uh, the price to book change improves things a bit. The change in size uh, makes things a little bit lower expected return. Although that change in size is relatively small, my guess is between the two, I'd have to go back and look at the numbers, but between the two, I'd say the price to book advantage over the size is more important. Um, but the fact that you then lay on top of that, the quality, um, that, that definitely is an important part of the difference. And one way to think of it is um, Im imagine that, that box, that part of the market in the bottom left-hand corner of the Morningstar style box, all of the companies that are small in value, some of them are a little bigger, some of them are more value-y. But now I tell you that within that box, there are companies that have better profitability, better financials. And there are other ones that have worse financials. Mm -hmm. There's companies in that box that are trending upward. They have positive momentum. And there are companies in that box that have negative momentum. I have two funds to choose from. One of them is going to pick in a way that mostly ignores those factors or those attributes. The other one is going to try and pick the ones that have better financials. It's going to try and pick the ones that have positive momentum which of those two funds would you rather have, right? In general, I think most of us would say, well, I'd rather own the quality companies, right? I'd rather own the better ones. And so um, regardless of whether you emotionally align with that or not, the academics and the, the objective analysis says that that'll serve you well in the long run. Yeah, it'll be a better choice. Okay, thank you. Yeah, it's Chris, a great question. I have, I have a question too, Chris. Sure. Uh, could, you, could you address the difference between expected return and the return you should expect? <laughs> sure. Yeah. The, the expected return is based on 20 or 30 years of history. And so it, what it's saying is if the future looks like the past, over the next 20 or 30 years, it might average out to something close to that. What you should actually expect the next year or next month or next week is something random. You should expect that the next return you get is going to be a, a meaningless data point on a very long data series. So that's that's another great question. I appreciate that, Daryl. See, right. you're not just here to watch. You're here to add a lot of value. <laughs> well, and you just let something slip there. You said 20 to 30 years worth of data is the basis of the next 20 to 30 years. Yep. Uh, would the next, would the, would the past 10 or 20 be the basis of the next uh, 10 or 20 ex expected returns? Or what's long enough to be meaningful? Evidently, you're saying 30 years is long enough to be meaningful. You know, I've, um, heard, I've heard Eugene Fama say that uh, you could wait a lifetime, right. you know, that you could wait 20 or 30 years for a, 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 for a tilt to small or a tilt to value to give you the return that you expect. Now, the telltale chart work that Daryl said uh, did, I don't think everyone passed what, 22 maybe, something like that? Something 20? like that, yeah. So it's between 20 and 30 years. Um, but just because it hasn't happened before doesn't mean it can't happen again. Sure. And, if, and part of what Fama said when he said that is, if I could guarantee you that you were gonna get the return in 25 years, there'd be no risk. And if there was no risk, there'd be no return. So, um, I think uh, you know one of the biggest philosophical differences between Jack Bogle's advice, you mentioned this earlier, Paul, and the advice that we give is that Jack Bogle wasn't expecting to have the opportunity to train most of the people who received his advice for an hour or tens of hours like we do with your listeners. He was expecting that his advice would be heard in a soundbite by the average investor and that that average investor wouldn't have the patience to wait or, or the knowledge to even know that they needed to have the patience to wait for a different return. And so if somebody asked me for advice and they weren't willing to learn, they weren't willing to take the time to learn, I think 
it would also be very simple because if you don't take the time to learn, you shouldn't be messing around with trying to get a different return. Just get the market return. Right. Great. The other thing too, you mentioned the telltale charts, Chris, and, and the, the thing about those is that it measures relative growth, growth relative to each other. Even if someone, one of the, one of the funds or one of the classes is, is, uh, flat or, or down, if one of the classes is trending down, it doesn't mean that it's not returning, making a positive return. Right. So it's not like you're losing money necessarily when you're, when you're, uh, invested in the other, in that asset class. So, yep. All right. Let's see if we can finish out a few more of these and get some Q and a. So, uh, so why did we change the, uh, this is the, uh, uh, international developed large cap blend fund from VEA, which is a Vanguard fund to the AVDE fund. Well, in this case, we're getting smaller size. We're going from 26.6 billion for VEA to 15.1 billion. And we're getting better price to book going from 1.52 to 1.43. And by the way, all of, all of these data, if you go check them on Morningstar are gonna be different today because they change over time. You know, it's always a snapshot when you make these decisions. Um, but the expense ratio went up from 0.05% to 0.23%. And the after expense factor predicted return increase was only 0.1%. So, you know, somebody might look at this and say, you know, one of the questions we're going to deal with later is how important is it that I change? If you've got a taxable event that's going to happen and you're looking at something that's only going to move you 0.1%, you might well decide to stay in the Vanguard fund. Um, you know, it didn't move very far, but my, my job is to kind of balance the need for stability with picking what I perceive to be best. And this is the one I perceive to be best right now based on my analysis. And so, so it got the, the best. Um, for the International Developed Countries Small Cap Value Fund, previously we had a dividend fund in the Wisdom Tree DLS, and um, we're switching to the Avantis Fund AVDV. And the average size here uh, actually goes up a little bit from 1.3 billion to 1.86 billion, and the price to book improved from 1.1 to 1.03, and the expense ratio went down. 0.58 to 0.36. Now on a factor predicted return basis, these were pretty close to the same, but the, uh, the fact that the expense ratio go down, goes down and the yield goes down, I, I feel like this is a better recommendation for the average investor because they don't have to worry about the taxes that they're gonna incur with the 2.45% yield versus the 1.63% yield. Um, so again, if you're holding in a tax deferred account and you're perfectly happy with DLS, um, you could choose to stick with it. You know, I would have no problem with that. Does your table reflect the number of issues in each of these funds? It, that's, that is on the um, article on the website. I didn't bring it into this presentation because I, I see it as a second order concern. The total number of companies in all of the funds, I think is uh, it's in the hundreds uh, with one possible exception, with much, which uh, might be RPV, which is lower, closer to the hundred than hundreds. But um, I think in all cases, there are enough companies in these funds to provide sufficient differentiation that, that they're okay. Mm -hmm. um, but if you want to see the numbers that were accurate as the t at the time I wrote the article, they're in the article on the website. Okay. So the last change was in emerging markets, we switched from the Wisdom Tree DGS fund to the Avantis AVEM fund. And this is a dramatic change in terms of the, how these two funds look. So the, the previous fund, DGS, is, uh, first of all, it's a dividend fund, so it generates a lot of income. Um, and second of all, it's fairly small. And because of the dividends, it's, it's got a bit of a value tilt. So in some respects, it was more like an emerging markets small value fund. Um, 
so I changed at a philosophical level. I wanted to switch to be more consistent with the actual portfolio design, which is that we have 10% in all these different funds. And one of those is an emerging markets fund. It's not an emerging markets small fund. It's not an emerging markets value fund. It's an emerging markets fund. Um, I also wanted to preserve the factor predicted or the expected return if I could. And uh, so this fund, even though it's much larger, going from 1.3 billion in size to 17 billion in size, and from a price to book of 1.06 to 1.42, its expense ratio advantage of 0.3%, going from 0.63% to 0.33%, um, combined with the other attributes of the fund, the fact that we're picking international companies, emerging markets companies, which is a volatile market, that have better financials, that have more profitability, higher quality, um, that set of things um, means that this fund has a similar level, uh, a similar expected return, but it has a much lower yield. And that much lower yield means I'm quite comfortable recommending this in a taxable account as well as a tax deferred account. So again, if you hold DGS in a tax deferred account and you wanna stick with it, I don't have any problem with that. Um, but if you hold DGS in a taxable account, I think over the long run, switching to something like AVEM will probably help you out because you won't be paying the taxes on the dividends along the way or as, as much of the dividends along the way. Um, and in either case, um, you know, all of our future return work is based on you setting up automatic dividend reinvestment and so, uh, or, or reinvesting it quickly in a way that rebalances your portfolio. Um, so anyway, that's that's the summary of all of the fund changes. Just a quick question, if I might there, Chris. Um, I, I know on my own account, uh, we have uh, a emerging markets fund that is a combination of large and small and value. Uh, I expect you're gonna talk about the alternative uh, uh, funds that you're leaving on the list. Is that part of the presentation today? Uh, well, I was just going to go there. So if we look ah, at, okay. yeah, if we look at the fund recommendations we have, I just walked through the ones on the left and you're right. If you look at emerging markets over on the right hand side, you you still have, um, there is a small over there, uh, the iShares MSCI, uh, let's see, hold on, where's the small? Uh, oh, yeah, yeah, so the uh, there's a small cap fund recommendation, which is the iShares MSCI Emerging Markets EEMS, and there's a value recommendation, which is the Spider Emerging Markets Small Cap EWX, and I've left the wisdom tree in there. Um, I just realized this morning that for some reason that fell off the website. So I'm going to go add it back in. But I think for somebody in a tax deferred account, it's fine. And one of the things I found when I chose that DGS fund that's really interesting is that it, it historically has tracked the performance of the three fund combo you use in your portfolio, Paul, fairly well. So again, if somebody wants to use that in a tax deferred account, I have no problem with that. I think that that's, uh, it's a little bit riskier. It's probably a little bit more volatile, but it has a little mm -hmm. bit higher expected return too. One, one would hope. The recent analysis I did says, yeah, it's probably a horse race between the two. So, yeah. Okay. All right. So um, one of the questions on everybody's mind, I think, or it should be on their mind is, well, how big a difference does it really make, right? If I switch. And uh, so I went and ran a back test at Portfolio Visualizer. And because we've recommended the Avantis funds, we don't have that much history. But if we look at the history that we do have, um, the first reaction you might have is, wow, that's actually a pretty big difference. DFA's Kager over this time frame from, um, I think this is October of 2019 through today, uh, DFA's Kager was 14%. Uh, the 2019 best in class was 12.6%. And the 2021, the new best in class is 14.83%. That, that's a big difference over the long haul. But I would, 
I would caution you to say that difference is over such a short period of time that it probably has more to do with small differences in how these funds performed and how they're created. Um, I think over the long haul, all three of those are great options. The, the, the thing I look at on the chart is that they, they track fairly well. They, they seem to be behaving um, you know, much like they should be. The primary difference in these from say an S&P 500 is their tilts towards small in value. And um, if you had an investment of $10,000 at the beginning, at the end, the difference is $11,700 to $12,020. It's not that great over this short period of time. So I, I think I feel good about the recommendations, but I'll be more interested when I have more history at looking at the difference um, historically. I, I think the real challenge to you now is to decide. I've given you as much information as I can. I've been as transparent as possible about why I made the choices I made, but you need to think about, do I create a taxable event in switching? You need to think about, do I trust these new recommendations more than the old recommendations? You need to think about, do I care more about the expense ratio that I pay every year or do I care about maybe in the long run getting the little bit of advantage for having you know, a, a, a higher tilt towards small in value? And then you need to decide for yourself what's best. Uh, anything, Paul or Daryl, you guys would like to add to that before we go to Q&A? I'm good. Great, great work. Thank you. Cool. All right. Well, let's let's go look at some questions and answers now. I'm going to have to jiggle things a little bit. So the first question we have here um, is from Michael. Paul, do you want to read Michael's question? Hey there. I won't lie. I'm really excited to see the results of the new ETF screenings. Here's my question ahead of your call next week. With these new recommendations, should you sell legacy positions, barring no tax consequences, like in, in an IRA, and swap into the new ETFs, or let the legacy positions ride and simply funnel new money into the updated list moving forward? And I like this. Keep fighting the good fight, Michael. <laughs> So right. Paul or, Paul or Daryl, either you have an answer for that one? Well, I think you touched on it yeah. a minute ago. The question is if, if the difference, and I did not see the difference being a small difference necessarily. Uh, uh, one of those three strategies paid what, 12 and a half percent and a couple other paid over 14 and I'm always looking for an extra half. And then what you're going to say is, well, don't expect you're going to get a, a point and a half uh, in the future, uh, choosing one particular strategy over another, another. But if I thought I would get a point and a half, I would change. Uh, and uh, of course, we don't know how old Michael is. An extra point and a half may not change my, my life. But for Michael, if he's young, it would certainly be worth taking a look, and by the way, it probably isn't a point and a half, but it looks like it could it could be a half a point, and we fight hard for a half a point. I think the other thing is that that he, he makes a key comment here on his, his positions and that there's no tax consequences to changing them. And I think Chris addressed that uh, earlier in that, you know, if you, if you have to sell in a taxable account, you should, think long and hard about doing that. Yeah. And, and, and remember, I just make one more comment. If you looked at the individual ETFs and one only adds one tenth of 1%, it, it, um, it doesn't get you very excited probably. Yep. Uh, and the, the, the challenge is that these things move back and forth enough that that one that was supposed to give you one tenth of 1% will give you five tenths of 1%. And the one that was supposed to give you three tenths will give you one tenth. Uh, and that's the, that's the outcome of the unknown and a lot of diversification. Well, and there's, there's probably some regret avoidance going on in his question about, you know, what about just swapping it all or, uh, you know, if, if you want to keep things simple, 
for the person who's going to take over your portfolio. If you're worried, you know, you're later in life and you're worried that your wife is going to pick it up uh, when you pass away or something like that, you might just swap it all and keep it really simple, small number of funds. If on the other hand, your big worry is you're going to regret it, you know, that you put some money in and then you watched it underperform the other one and you're going to check it every month, then it's kind of like a dollar cost averaging question. You might want to hold both funds for a while and see how it goes. So I, I, I think it's a very personal question. Can we go to the next one? Sure. All right. Question number two, Daryl, you want to read it? Sure. I need to move a few things here. so I can see the whole thing. Jake says, team, I have been using a taxable account at M1 Finance for the past six months, and it has been great. My questions is with the update in the best in class ETF, should I transfer my money from the old best in class ETFs? to the new ETFs and create a taxable event or keep my money in the old best in class ETFs and start a new account for the new ETFs and add money in that account going forward. I'm in my thirties and don't plan on using the money for 20 to 30 years, if that is helpful. Nice read, Daryl. <laughs> I've never seen you get that excited. That's great. Ooh. <laughs> We're going to so, put you in charge of this, reading. This is, this is actually a very good question. So I'm anxious. It's to a see great question. Yeah. So I, I do know a little bit about M1 finance and uh, you can create a second pie and you could, if you like, create that second pie using the video I created on the website that explains, you know, how to switch Actually, the video on the website is more about how to switch the pie that you got, um, but you could use some of the pointers and tips in that video to uh, create a new pie based on our recommendations. And you could then uh, decide to have some of your money go into the new pie or all of your money go into the new pie and keep the old pie. And again, I think this is a regret avoidance strategy, right? If you, if you want to um, kind of have your finger in both, in both things and, and just feel like you've hedged your bets, go ahead. Uh, it adds complexity that most of the analysis says is not going to help you out in the long run. But if it keeps you invested and lets you sleep at night, sure, you know, I, I don't have any problem with it. Um, so then what you get from M1 at the first of the next year is a report for each one of your accounts you, yeah, How you, you did for the year dividend wise or capital gain wise. You could, you could even, I wouldn't recommend this, but you can even go in every month and look and see how the two pies have done, right? You can track it and mm -hmm. watch. Um, the, the theory is uh, if you read the material at Avantis and talk to them, the theory is that they will, uh, that this, more uh, balanced strategy should perform more consistently over time. Um, when you have more attributes in your criteria or your selection process, it should deliver more consistent performance over time. You might see that, but I wouldn't, I wouldn't put much weight into deciding until you'd had a year or two, you know, another year or two. So, yeah. So at M1, Chris, uh, because a lot of young people, may not want to rebalance if they have a if they have six or ten different equity asset classes it may be okay for the rest of their life just to put money in and accumulate and eat, let each asset class do its own thing will will m1 allow that to happen I, the thing I love about M1 in terms of automation is that it will apply your new contributions towards a rebalance. And so you can, it's the closest thing to autopilot without being in a, in a robo advisor that you can get uh, next to maybe a target date fund, right? A pure mm -hmm. target date fund is also going to do that for you. Um, and I think it, using Jack Bogle's advice of, you know, just, just regularly contribute and don't look would work great at M1. Mm -hmm. And the more you don't look, the less your emotions can get into the equation and, and hurt you. And so, uh, yeah, I think M1 is really powerful in that regard. There is one possible problem with that. If you don't look, you may not realize you have enough to retire now rather than waiting five more years. So 
I would look in every three to five years just to check if you're getting closer <laughs> to retirement. That's prudent. Sure. Yeah, that's good. I, I think we'll be lucky to find many investors who can go three to five years without looking, but or months. <laughs> yes. You know, I think one one other thing about both this question and the previous question is that I'm reminded of an old senior engineer I used to work with who who's one of his favorite sayings or was when we were trying to decide whether to do something with the design or not was to say, you know, better is the enemy of the good enough. Absolutely. And so if, if, you know, if you're trying to decide whether to go to the 2021 recommendations versus the 2019 recommendations, they're both probably good enough. Agreed. Agreed. All right, I'll read question number three. Russell in Mississippi writes, with the intention to invest for the long term, is there a possibility that changing the funds every two years to the latest best in class recommendations will have some short term negative consequences to the long term returns? And we've talked about this a lot. So I'll just repeat, think about uh, whether or not you have a taxable event. I think that's the biggest thing. Um, just layering on top of that, though, as you saw, there is a little bit of a spread in trading ETFs. So if you trade every two years, those spreads get divided by two. If you trade every 10 years, those spreads get divided by 10. So it's a, it's a little bit of a tax that you're paying. And so I, I think um, having a bias towards stability is very much a good thing. Yeah. And that's part I of the reason if, I only update them every two years. Yeah. Yeah. I wonder if if there's also a little bit of a behavioral finance risk here, and that's that if you go in and you tweak these things every year or so, you get used to tweaking and tweaking your portfolio. Well, and every, every, that may not be a good thing in the yeah, long term. Yeah, I've, I've used the analogy before that your portfolio is like a bar of soap. Every time you touch it, it gets smaller. Um, and that behavioral finance part is really true because it, every time you go in and you look, it gives you the chance to... Uh, get excited about how one of your asset classes has grown and get sad about how one of your cl asset classes has gotten smaller and, and make the bad decision to buy high and, and buy more of the one that's grown and sell low, you know, sell the one that's gotten smaller. So yeah, it, it the behavioral finance thing is really, really, a, that's a true factor for sure. Yeah. And, and there are a couple of, of, um, things going on here. One thing is Avantis is new to the market. Yeah. And they are bringing uh, enough of a different approach. And of course, as we know, DFA is coming out with ETFs as well. In fact, they have uh, a couple, but, but we probably aren't going to see very many major changes along the way that are going to lead to th even three tenths of 1% is really a big deal. Uh, I think, in terms of, of trying to, to stay in the same asset class and, and figure out a way to wrestle down another three-tenths of 1%, that's, that's great. Um, the thing where I would, I would not be excited, if somebody managed money and they told me that their strategy was every two or three years, they would look to see how the portfolio is doing and if it's not doing well, we're going to go in there and we're going to kick out the poor performers and we're going to find a good performer that, uh, uh, that will do better. And that's a trick that Wall Street has used for probably 100 years it's to pretend they can make a trick. Pardon? It's an underperforming trick. Yes, it, it is an under, exactly it's an underperforming trick. It's going to hurt more than likely. But this is not... This is not that kind of a change. It's a change with the intention of staying in the same asset class, but finding the most efficient way to, to emulate that class. So it's a, it's a good thing, I think, uh, what you're doing. And the other is not a good thing. All right, let's go on to question number four. Uh, Paul, you wanna read this one? Uh, well, after what Daryl just did, I don't know. I've, I've been <laughs> ramping up, Paul. Oh, dear Paul. Uh, first, <laughs> I'd like to thank you for all your help you give. I am grateful to have discovered your newsletter and teachings. I have been reading your Talking Millions book and have started a fund for my grandchild who is one year old. 
uh, and I've started with a small cap value fund, SLYV. Would you suggest I add additional ETFs or maybe add additional small cap funds? I also have, uh, I also gave your book to my son and I'm trying to, trying to help uh, his family invest according to some of your teachings. And then he goes on to say, thank you. Uh, by the way, I, I cheated on this one. I didn't know you were going to use this. I actually called and talked to this fellow. I mean, somebody is putting away money for a one-year-old. I wanted to know how much. I wanted to know what it was for. Mm -hmm. And um, and I think I truly think it's a very long-term position. And of course, he started out with small cap value. And I was concerned, is he going to do all small cap value? And he was putting away enough money that I thought maybe what would be justified would be a more diversified portfolio. And what I ended up suggesting was that he use a four fund strategy that would give him some large cap and both blend and value and small cap, both blend and value. He could do it with, and we're going to be talking about this in coming weeks, he could do it with half U.S., half international to each, but still picking up those same asset classes. And wouldn't it be wonderful if when this child is about 16 and you can open up and show what has happened to this money that you put in there and explain that the dream is that someday far into the future, this is going to continue to do what it's done. And what I want to show you, he, he says to his grandson, he says, I want to show you the research that I looked at to make this decision back in 2021. And I want you to see what we knew about the past then. And now I want you to see what happened over the last 14 or 15 years and see that, you know something, it turns out it was more of the same. And this means that you are on your way to this portfolio, broadly diversified, low cost, and all those things that we like for them. And just let it go. Let it be and don't try to outsmart the market. It might be a, a, a sales pitch that will actually get that child to stay the course with that money because it will have this long history from 1928 where Daryl starts it through 2021 or 20 with, where the grandfather takes over and there you go. I, I think it's a, it's, it's a great way to approach getting these young people to keep this money heading in the direction that you want it to go. Well, that's, that's great. I almost pulled this one out because it was a lot like the others, but you had a different answer. And I think that was fantastic. So I think we keep rolling. That's great. Okay. All right. So uh, question number five, Daryl, you're up. Okay. This is from Juan. He says, a little more than a year of history doesn't sound like much. Wouldn't something like 10 years be more reasonable minimum time for a fund before it can be trusted? I thought in stock market timelines, relying on one, two, or even five years of performance history is not recommended. How does the bid ask spread for these new funds compare to other funds in the BIC list or, what, or with similar Vanguard ETFs? I'd be concerned that such a new fund would need some more time to have enough trading volume to lower that bid ask spread. So this is a great question from Juan. Thanks for reading it, Daryl. Yeah. Um, and, uh, you know, people are already asking me about the DFA funds, which have even less history than than these, uh, and um, it, it's it's tricky. I totally agree with the sentiment, and if you're uncomfortable making decisions based on that little history, stick with the 2019 recommendations. They're fine. Um, personally, I felt like the combination of what I could learn about their methodology, reading their prospectuses talking to the people at Avantis and looking at the one year history with daily trades, uh, I could analyze in the US and monthly trades internationally that it was an okay time to make the change. But you may feel differently. And, and the truth is it does take a long time to really get comfortable. 
Um, I will say though, that over the year, they've been very good at not having what's called style drift, um, which suggests that somebody behind the scenes is trying to play Wizard of Oz and do something you know, magical and tricky. They are very consistent at what they do. It's very uh, systematic. Um, I don't get the impression I'm buying into somebody second guessing the market behind the scenes at all. But having said that, you know, it's a reasonable question. Regarding the bid ask spreads, I did some analysis this morning. So I went to ETF.com and I looked at all of these and um, it's, a fair, it's a fair concern. But remember, you only pay the bid ask spread when you buy or you sell. So if you're a buy and hold investor who's gonna hold for 10 years, you would divide these differences by 10 and they would become less than 0.01%. Um, but the differences, I'll, I'll just read them off for the people on the podcast. In the case of going from VTI to AVUS, it was going from 0.01% to 0.13%, which is a big difference. Um, in the case of SLYV going to the Avantis US small value, it went from 0.09% to 0.17%, which is a smaller difference. Um, for the VEA to AVDE, it went from 0.02% to 0.13%. That's a pretty good size difference. And then for both the international small value and um, emerging markets, it essentially stayed the same, going from 0.11% to 0.12% for international small value and 0.12% to 0.12% for emerging markets. So I think it's something to be aware of. Uh, but I'm not particularly concerned about it unless you're going to trade a lot. If you're going to trade a lot, then um, that's going to hurt you in probably more ways than this. But this would be one of the ways that you'd get hurt. Yeah. What about the, the volume issue, the trading volume issue though, that he was interested in? Or is that reflected in the spread? Uh, there's, we'll, we'll get to that in a different question, but okay. the, it is reflected in the spread. The spread is driven by the trading volume. Um, but there is another question that deals with that particular uh, thing, and we'll we'll talk about that later, I think. And Chris, I would add one comment about his first question about the uh, uh, the short time period. If somebody told me they were going to start up an S and P five hundred index fund, and they had a one year track record, and what they produced was virtually the same. I would say, oh, yeah, they're managing an S&P 500 fund, and that would be okay. There have to be some reason to pick theirs over somebody else's. Right. But in the case of Avantis, the, 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 of course, the, the goal was to bring DFA to the public. That was, in a way, what, what their goal was, and uh, the DFA-like funds. And these, these folks are well qualified to know how to build a DFA like uh, fund, and they did it, but they are basically index or what they call passive asset class uh, funds. And it's not like somebody who's an active manager. These, uh, you know more about the Avantis than I do, Chris. Do you get any sense of the activity, of the changes in that portfolio? I, you know, I spent about an hour on the phone with uh, our contact at Avantis on Friday to prepare for some of the questions and things. And one of my questions to him was, uh, what percentage of the trading that's done is based on, uh, you know, judgment outside of some algorithm or numbers that are, are driving the trades. In other words, how, how much of it is systematic and how much of it is discretionary? And he said, the overwhelming majority of it is systematic. There's some tiebreaker decisions to be made at the margins or the edges, but he said the vast majority of it, it's almost like you pour the numbers in a, in a computer and they spit out the answer, you know, it's, mm -hmm. and, and that's reflected in a measure that people can look at. You can go look at the R squared. Um, it's, it's a wonky measure, but it basically says how um, you can go to portfolio visualizer and you can do a, uh, a regression analysis on these funds. And it basically says how much of the funds behavior matches what was going on in these other asset classes in the marketplace over time. 
and their funds score like a 97 percent 98 percent if you find a fund that's like 80 percent or 90 percent that means somebody behind the scenes is doing something tricky mm -hmm. you know they're trying to do something special to get a different return than what they deserve for the way they're investing yeah. and usually that bites them so so i think it's it's a very systematic approach that they're taking very little discretion and and that that makes me more comfortable with it yeah. great okay i think it's my turn to read one so Tom says, first, I see your new mutual fund recommendations. When will the new ETF recommendations come out? The ones by fund family. So I actually kind of want to ask Tom and everybody else why they care. Um, that's my first question because, uh, you know, ETFs are free to trade almost everywhere now. So I'm still not sure I fully understand why people want fund family recommendations. Um, so that's an opportunity for people to come back to me. Low expenses. I'll bet you it's about low expenses. Well, if it's low expenses, then go buy Vanguard and be done with it. You know, we well, have that's what, but we have we have Vanguard recommendations it, for exactly, Vanguard only. Exactly. We have a Vanguard family of recommendations, and I think they're still good. So if that's what it is, you've got it. Uh, and then second, he says, I'm 68 and moving to a formal written investment program patterned on the ultimate buy and hold. I've listened to many of Paul's podcasts, and he often really pounds the table for index funds and low expense ratios, particularly at Vanguard. Chris Pedersen's new recommendations appear to be moving more and more to actively managed funds, or at least beta funds, with higher expense recommendations like Avantis. Would Paul and Chris please discuss this? Um, I think this is arm wrestle and try to reconcile these divergent views. Many thanks. So, Paul, you want to you want to well, sit back and watch? <laughs> I'm certainly not going to say I'm mad as hell and I'm not going to take it anymore. I the fact <laughs> is is my own portfolio is made up of these factor funds, uh, and I have been paying more than I would have had to pay at Vanguard for the right to own those funds. And what I've always told people, and I still feel the same way, if we go through a long-term market and large beats small, Vanguard is likely to have a better performance. If growth beats value, Vanguard is likely to have a better performance. Now, what do we know? We know that, that uh, we've been through a period where large has been better than small and growth has been better than value. And because the Vanguard funds represent larger average size companies in a particular asset class and more growthy <laughs> companies uh, in their kind of growth oriented and, and not so deeply discounted value, Vanguard is set up to do better uh, during those periods. What we know is those periods can go on for a long time, but that value has beat over the long-term growth and small has beat large. So the advantage goes to theoretically those factor funds that, that replicate those the way that at least I want in my portfolio because I wouldn't does not make it right or does not make it happen. But from everything we know about the long past, that is going to serve people, particularly young people who have decades ahead of them. I have maybe a decade. So that, you know, there's, a, there's a big difference in terms of expectations. But I don't need much more money because I've only got a decade left. And these kids are going to need a lot of money. And so they really need to do better. So the one thing I'm going to argue with you on that is that I, I'm hoping you have decades left. We'd like to, oh, <laughs> <laughs> we'd, uh, we'd like to still have you around for decades. But um, yeah, I, I think that um, both are important. Expense ratio is important, but... Yeah. The way I choose the funds is to try and choose funds where I think that if there is an added expense, it's worthwhile. 
And our funds on balance are, um, especially when you consider the 1% you have to pay to get into DFA funds, uh, they're, they're delivering a lot for a relatively low expense. The overall expense for the portfolio is very low compared to what you would pay for a DFA mm -hmm. portfolio. So mm -hmm. um, I, I, I feel good about the recommendations, but there will be people who care much more about expense and I have nothing against them investing at Vanguard. The, the one other thing I think is consistent with work Daryl has done with the telltale charts though, is that that catch up between the lag when you know when uh, small and value are out of favor, a lot of times the catch up happens quickly. It, yeah. it, it right. happens over a short period of time. And so um, you have these long periods of time when you can uh, not reap the benefits uh, and, and feel like you're just paying the expense and not getting what you've paid for. Um, and then all of a sudden, you know, the catch up happens and, and um, that's, that's where the return comes. And by the way, uh, and we're going to have a, a podcast focusing just on these portfolios. Uh, Tom has access to our recommendations for low-cost mutual funds and low-cost ETFs. Yes. So uh, we're there. We're there to help uh, meet as many needs as we can. Okay, I think we're uh, over to you, Paul on this oh. one, question seven. Oh my gosh. You know, I'm looking at the time and I know that uh, I'm watching to see if Daryl's starting to get edgy, but he, if I know he not. has to go pretty soon. And I certainly do not want to keep him. I want, let's see if we can't in the next five minutes or so. Uh, did you have anything else other than the Q and A, Chris? No, that's it. Okay. Uh, well, you know, this gets into into M1 and Pies, I want to do a separate uh, podcast just on M1 and how to manage it. Would it be better to wait for that? Or do you see something in here that needs to be answered today? I think, uh, let, me, let me summarize Jim's question and answer it today, because I think I can answer it fairly quickly. Um, and it did come up earlier. So he's basically saying, you know, M1 trades once a day, won't there be a volume spike if all of Paul's traders adopt the new ETFs on Wednesday and trade all at once, won't that be an issue? And millions if of people. Yeah, millions of people. <laughs> so, so first of all, I don't, I, I talked about this at, at length with, um, with our contact at Avantis. And we did a little research at M1 and we came up with, um, I found this information on their site and my contact at Avantis and I read this together and we both said, oh good, they know how to do this. It'll be okay. And basically what this says is you will receive the market price at time of execution. M1 and all broker dealers have a duty of best execution that legally requires brokers to seek the best execution reasonably available for all customer orders. To comply with this requirement, brokers evaluate the orders they receive from all customers in aggregate and periodically assess which competing markets, market makers, or electronic communication networks offer the most favorable terms of execution. So in essence, if there was a huge order that all clustered up and was going to drive a, drive a problem, that also drives an opportunity for M1 to go to a market maker and negotiate the best price that they can get. And what Jeff said uh, was that he was confident that they would, they would uh, do the right thing if they followed this process as it's called out on their website, and it would work out well for investors. So I, um, I can't promise you what you will get at M1, you know, with their trading. I have done a number of test trades there in the past and found that their bid ask spreads were um, as, as good as the average that I saw in the market. Um, I know that recently they've changed their trading window. They say that it provided some advantages. I haven't done redone the tests since they changed it. So um, if you're really, really concerned about this, you might do a small trade and see what you get right? You might do a small trade and, and see how it changes things and, and then do a bigger trade when you're comfortable with it. Or you might spread out the changes over time. Um, 
but uh, based on everything we could gather, it didn't look like it was going to be a concern. So I did want to address that one today because I think it was one that was potentially holding him up and it had been touched on earlier in our conversation. So with that, Paul, do we want to wrap it today? And maybe- you know, and, I, and I, want to, I want to tell everybody that, that we have dozens of questions we haven't even seen yet. Yes, that's uh, true. And so we may have another uh, session uh, on this same topic. Uh, we will be having the session in the coming weeks on the portfolios themselves, the all value, the all small cap, the, uh, your, your lifetime um, target date portfolio that you've developed uh, that I don't think everybody knows about, Chris. So we've got a lot of good stuff coming and believe me, I just get every year, I'm excited about updating the ultimate buy and hold strategy. Uh, we're gonna have to spend more time this year on the four fund versus the 10 fund to make sure people understand the, the pros and cons and all the fine tuning tables and, the, and the, the accumulation tables and the distribution tables. Um, and Daryl tells me that we're online to have everything done in the next two hours, right, Daryl? Oh, <laughs> Sorry, absolutely. just kidding. Yeah, right. Just kidding. But well, the other thing is too. This year, there's a big difference because we're going to roll in the the Ryman regress terms. That right. Yeah. yeah so that's that, that will that will freak everybody out because the numbers will be different. Yeah. yeah. Well, it'll not different in out. some cases than they have been in the past, and so uh, or in the previous previous editions of the ultimate buy and hold and the other other portfolios so that'll be a big change too i i think though that that touches on this idea of science versus art uh, right if if people are too freaked out about that they're probably thinking this is too scientific the 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 time machine we have to explore the past is uh, no better than a fuzzy crystal ball for the future right i mean it's it's fuzzy and just to make sure for those of you who have not heard us talk about this before, basically what we're adding are results in the, mostly in the 70s for internationals. And we've been underexposing in, in our tables. We have not been showing the advantage of having the internationals uh, in the portfolio. And there were international <laughs> securities back in the 70s, and we've had to do some digging. But I think the work that that uh, Chris has done on that is exceptional, and it it it's a better it's a better story because all it is is a story because it's never a fact when we look backwards because there's just too many moving parts and and if you even started an S and P 500 fund 50 year or 70 years ago you probably wouldn't have picked exactly the same companies that the academics have picked to create the lookalike of the S&P 500 70 years ago. So uh, it is it is close. Anyway, thank you both very much. You guys are just great. Thank you, you listeners and viewers out there. We really appreciate having the opportunity to, to, to work for you. And um, uh, we're really tight this first quarter in topics, but I'm anxious to be gathering topics for next quarter, if you want to drop me an email, paul at paulmerriman.com and, and, uh, and, and make your case. So uh, thanks for being with us, and we'll look forward to seeing you next week. Thank you very much.